Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining me for today's SMIE Consulting Midweek Roundup. I'm your host, Marty Bennett, and today we're going to be walking you through uh, three news stories that have popped over our news feeds in the last week or so. Uh, I want to apologize for those who uh, were tuning in last Wednesday. Uh, expecting a midweek roundup. I was unfortunately unable to uh, conduct a roundup because I was in flight uh, returning from a, a consult visit out, out at the University of Oregon. Uh, looking forward to chatting with you today about uh, some, of the, uh, some of these news stories. But first, before we get into that, I want to make everyone aware, for those that are new to the roundup, uh, who we are at SMIE Consulting. That's Social Media and International Education Consulting, a company I set up five years ago uh, when I left Education USA to allow me to, uh, to do consulting work for uh, clients around the world, but also to help better serve uh, the U.S. higher education community as they develop their international enrollment strategic plan. And so what I'd like to do is first uh, share uh, the website for SMIE Consulting, and I do that over in the comments section of, on the Facebook page. Uh, for those that are listening on the podcast, thanks for subscribing, and it's always a pleasure to get your feedback on, on the roundups and how, that, uh, how you're listening to them and how you're uh, finding the, the news that you're hearing each week uh, productive for you. So if you are interested in uh, the uh, podcast, uh, you can subscribe on any of your major uh, podcasting providers from iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Podbean, and Spotify. So uh, hoping that those uh, will allow you uh, some chance to catch up uh, when you uh, have a little downtime or while you're on a walk or run. Uh, hopefully uh, find the information useful for you in your, in your work. The, where, where you may be wondering these news stories come from each week, I've had a number of people ask over, over the last few months uh, where I get my stories, and a lot of them will come uh, week to week from, uh, from the Chronicle or, or Inside Higher Ed, but usually they're getting their stories from other places as well. So I, I cast the net fairly wide, and to do that, I produce a newsletter each Monday uh, that comes out Monday morning, 9 a.m., called the All the SMI New E! News Fit to Share. Uh, and that comes out uh, with a summary of about 12 to 15 uh, different, uh, different stories related to international uh, education and then about four or five social media related stories. That's an area of, of the business that I think a lot of universities and colleges uh, uh, don't leverage enough internationally. And we talk through some of those stories on the, on the newsletter. But we do pick three of those stories from the newsletter each week. Uh, to feature here on the Midweek Roundup. And today, uh, we're going to be taking a look at those. But for those who want to subscribe to the newsletter, I've also dropped a link to that in the comments section on the Facebook page as well. So I encourage you all to, to take a look at that if you're not already subscribed. Now, I do want to take a, take a moment to uh, reflect on the last couple of weeks uh, in international education. Uh, this is a time of year when, obviously, new students are arriving uh, new student that uh, you're, uh, you're, you're, you've got, uh, you've had over a year oftentimes uh, uh, to, to uh, get in touch with uh, these students and develop relationships with them. And now that now is a point where they start arriving on your campuses, the advisors or counselors you've been working with overseas have become a big part of your life. And in terms of uh, what your the most eagerly anticipated time uh, of the year is uh, when new students arrive on campus. Uh, certainly for me, as uh, someone who'd worked on campuses at five different institutions, orientation was always the most exciting time for me when getting to see those faces full of excitement, full of jet lag, but also just a real, a real joy of being, uh, being uh, at their destination that they've been longing to, to reach for so long. So uh, first news story is, is related to that. And for those of you, Ahmad, thanks for joining. One of my former international students uh, at Marquette University. Glad to see you, Ahmad. Hope you are well and hope your family is as well. Uh, I've got some be uh, beautiful child there. Uh, and I hope, uh, hope to, uh, and uh, I, I remember now that Ahmad's on, I remember the orientation program having met him and his father when I was overseas. Uh, and on, a, on a recruitment trip and, and finally getting the opportunity to welcome him to campus. That was just an amazing time. Uh, and this, uh, this is so certainly something uh, this time of year with orientations going on across the country that uh, there's a lot of excitement, but there's also 
a lot of fun easiness, uh, particularly for students uh, that are coming new to the country, but also returning students. And uh, I, I, I turn to this, this news story, uh, and uh, we, we, we think about this every, every so often uh, at this time of year, but we don't realize just the true impact of it. Uh, there's a couple of stories that, were, that are somewhat related, but uh, the first one uh, is related to uh, the uh, Palestinian refugee student who'd gone through, uh, our, gone through Education USA in Lebanon, where his family had settled. Uh, and had been ad had gone through the competitive college club, the incredible uh, program developed through Education USA advising centers around the world. Uh, but the center in Lebanon uh, had, uh, through Ahmed East, had done such incredible work with him. And through the competitive college club, he actually lived. Uh, had to take a train to come to uh, uh, from Tyre to come to Beirut for his uh, for his program. But he had been admitted to Harvard, and he was all set, got his visa this summer, and was set and ready to come. And he was initially denied entry to the United States in Boston when he landed to start his uh, educational career at Harvard. Uh, there is a silver lining here we'll get to. But uh, we all know that this past summer, um, at the beginning of the summer, around Memorial Day, uh, the DS-160 form uh, start, began to include questions on social media, that students had to list their social media accounts that they'd had uh, the presence on over the last five years. That's now standard practice for all students that are applying or all non-immigrant visa applicants to the United States have to go through this. Uh, but now um, what you're seeing, that's this student had gone through that process in, uh, with the U.S. Embassy in Lebanon, uh, had been cleared and obviously issued a visa uh, for any con if there were, had been any concerns at that point. But now this student enters the United States and uh, the Customs and Border Patrol uh, officers in Logan Airport in Boston uh, detained him and eventually deported him. Uh, the re reason given, uh, at least from the student's perspective, was that friends, social media posts of his friends on a particular social media platform uh, were negative about the United States. And as a result, he said that's why he was uh, deported. We don't know the CBP side. They don't, typically, they don't ever comment on these kind of individual cases. But if that's the case, then that's certainly beyond the pale as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it's a, an overreach of, on the part of CBP officers involved and certainly one that should trouble all of us. Uh, it's not an isolated incident uh, that there have been other reports in Los Angeles of uh, students being de detained and then deported. Uh, Chinese students especially, there's a group of nine that were coming to, returning to come back to Arizona State University that were deported uh, after re-entry. Uh, they were not allowed entry and were, um, there's stories coming out of that. So some of this had to do uh, with them being entrapped by um, or forced to admit by CBP officers that they had cheated on exams or cheated on, uh, on an IELTS test or something or a TOEFL exam at some point. Uh, obviously, that's very concerning and that uh, a student that had already been admitted, had already come and studied in the United States is being denied re-entry even though they had valid visas. Uh, to, and these kind of issues are really concerning, I think, from obviously any, everybody's perspective, from the U.S. institutional perspective, from the overseas advising perspective, from the institutions and schools that these students might have come from originally, but it casts a lot of doubt. And uh, uh, on the system and whether or not it's really set up to allow them to succeed. So a lot of concern here uh, that is being uh, reflected across the message boards. Uh, and uh, we were thinking maybe you know, for these Chinese students, it was STEM related uh, because of extra scrutiny that they've been given that their visas were or were revoked. Uh, but all of this group of nine, their visas were revoked. They were forced to return home. Uh, this is uh, not, they were not all STEM, maybe one or two of them were. Uh, so this is a real, uh, out, real issue, I think, for a lot of, uh, a lot of institutions now that are grappling with, well, what's, where, where, why, is the, why is the line moving? And why is there such uncertainty which, where there used to be much more black and white on these kinds of issues? So some of that is going to be down to uh, how CBP officers are trained and what latitude that they're given. Seems to, be, uh, seems to me that they're given a great deal of latitude in this respect in terms of a line officer. And then their supervisors when they take a student into secondary for further investigation. So this is something that I think is a particular concern and one that uh, U.S. institutions and 
Uh, certainly presidents uh, have gotten involved, university presidents have gotten involved. Uh, those that are following um, the story of the Harvard, Harvard student that was denied entry, the good news is uh, after outreach from, uh, from, uh, from a variety of people, including the president of, uh, of Harvard, uh, and that, uh, uh, that uh, this allowed for uh, his, his situation to be resolved and he was readmitted to the United States, uh, had his visa uh, renewed uh, by the embassy in, in uh, Beirut, and he was able to come back and is now beginning his studies. So this is, that's a bit of, a bit of good news on an otherwise uh, terrible story. Uh, that is, again, when you think all of all the potential options that international students have nowadays and the opening of borders, um, opening of, uh, of countries to international students on so many different levels, uh, at, looking at Canada, Australia, the UK, New Zealand, even China, uh, opening their doors to international students. And it seems, uh, unfortunately, uh, that these kinds of issues are putting some, some real uh, obstacles, uh, whether real or, act or perceived, these obstacles are in place and, and causing a lot of ill will, I think, in the, in the end. Uh, so it, action needs to be taken from the top. Uh, and certainly, uh, whether it happens from State Department level, certainly they've made uh, overtures over the last couple of months to say that, uh, for example, on the China issue, that uh, no matter what's happening on, on the political level uh, between our, our governments in terms of trade and negotiations there, uh, Chinese students are always welcome here. There was a big uh, uh, speech at the, um, at, the, at the Education USA Forum uh, from the Deputy Assistant Secretary on this issue on China specifically and saying that actually visa re rejection rates have gone down in China. Uh, so that there's 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 the evidence that says well visa visa denial rates are down in China, but then you have these issues of these students being deported. So maybe that's that that certainly doesn't reflect a State Department issue. That reflects a CBP or Department of Homeland Security issue. So there's a lot of moving parts, obviously, with U.S. immigration these days, and that's something that certainly is well uh, worth paying attention to as as the time goes along. What I what I really wanted to lead with today, but uh, since I, I had had one of my former students on the line, uh, uh, I wanted to make sure I, I referenced the orientation, and that story just seemed to fit right there. But an, another uh, another uh, ver actually very uh, very opposite reaction to this story uh, is, is actually one of, of pure joy, uh, and that was uh, seeing a, a colleague um, of mine at. Uh, uh, Yale uh, emailed this to me uh, over the weekend and asked if I'd seen the story, and I said uh, absolutely, and we'll be de I'd definitely be including it in this week's roundup uh, because, frankly, it's it's one that uh, makes us renews our hope in in what what is possible with students around the world, students who come from nothing, uh, like the Palestinian refugee family of this student who's now at Harvard, and went through a competitive college called got his, got a full scholarship that allowed him to come to. Uh, to the United States for study. That, those are the success stories that, that just warm your heart when you hear them. Uh, the second story is actually uh, from a program that was uh, fat, created uh, almost 20 years ago now by a former Education USA advisor, Rebecca Ziglamano, uh, in Zimbabwe. And Rebecca, if you're out there, congratulations on uh, and finally getting some well-deserved well press, national press through the New York Times. Uh, this article that came out over the weekend uh, is just a, really warms your heart. And for those who know Rebecca, she, you know she's a tireless advocate for her students. And uh, if you're on the university side, you've been asked uh, to, uh, to, to open your doors to, to her students, the USAP Students United States Achievers Program that she created uh, so many years ago that have placed students around, uh, around the globe, but it's at the, at the best institutions in the United States. Uh, and she's been able to do that through her hard work and determination, but she will put it down to just the incredible talent that these students have and desire and drive that these students have in Zimbabwe, where she's based. Uh, but the program, the USAP program, has, has, has spawned, uh, spawned uh, in other countries as well, throughout Africa and other, other regions, that allow um, students in those countries who are from very uh, disadvantaged situations uh, when I say disadvantaged, uh, I'm not talking the adversity score of the college board that may or may not exist anymore, uh, but I'm talking about students who, who, who were, uh, f uh, families were farmers, uh, herdsmen, uh, or students who have lost both their parents to AIDS, as this student from, uh, that's now attending Columbia, 
uh, that's profiled in this New York Times story. Uh, Ricardo, glad you could join us too, all the way from Lisbon. Hope you're well in Portugal. Uh, great to see, uh, great to see you on as well. Uh, and these are the kind of stories um, through these USAP students, uh, former, uh, that are now uh, doing great things uh, that have gone on after this initial undergraduate program. That come, they come to the U.S. on this uh, full ride scholarship, basically. Uh, uh, through USAP and the universities that, that, that enroll them. But then they've, uh, so many of them have gone on to master's and doctoral level programs and completed them and are now uh, developing, uh, help, returning to Zimbabwe to help develop that country. And that was always Rebecca's dream for USAP. And uh, I, I hope that continues, long may it continue, because these are the kind of students that are uh, just remarkable uh, stories of, uh, of determination and, and drive and success. and certainly need to be profiled as, uh, as much as possible. And it's to show, uh, show everybody else, all these other universities that wonder, why do we need to economically diversify our international student classes? Uh, these are the kind of students who you give the chance to and with the drive that they have and the, the uh, amount of uh, obstacles that they've had to overcome that you know that you're getting uh, someone who is not gonna, not gonna let themselves fail at your institution. They're gonna thrive. Uh, because uh, they're going to be in a, hopefully a welcoming environment, they're going to have the support they need, and they're going to be not just from your institution, but from the network that uh, has been set up to help support them. But they are going to be future leaders in their countries, and ultimately that's what you want. Uh, and the students that have brought, pulled themselves up uh, by, their, uh, by their own, uh, with the help of universities that are uh, recognizing the talent and that uh, individual a drive that uh, uh, these USAP students, uh, competitive college club students, uh, at uh, this from uh, for, that are not not just in Lebanon but are across across the Education USA network as well. We look at Opportunity Fund students, uh, another Education USA program uh, that have allowed so many students in similar circumstances to access US higher education. Uh, you look at. Uh, Simon Nascimento from uh, from Brazil, uh, an opportunity former opportunity student that's gone on and is now an international admissions officer at the University of Chicago. Uh, I mean, just incredible success stories uh, that uh, these kinds of programs uh, really uh, uh, really uh, highlight uh, that uh, the talent that exists in this world that wants to come to the United States, and uh, the, uh, the gov uh, when the U.S. government puts in. Uh, gives too much power to individuals to make decisions at the border uh, or other places in the, the student flow, immigration flow, it really can just, it really just hurts. It hurts, hurts your heart when you see those, these things happening because you know uh, the, what the opportunities that these students have to come to the U.S. Um, for studies. Uh, we're lucky to have them, frankly. Yes, they're going to be, they're grateful that they're getting the opportunity, but our institutions, our country is going to be better off because of these students coming to our shores. So um, much like uh, the students that uh, we see coming to our campuses that don't, aren't, don't get the press. Uh, I wonder, though, um, you know, we talk about this, uh, uh, these USAP students, but uh, I talk about the student from Lebanon hit, uh, that was uh, denied and then finally has been re uh, admitted to the United States after public pressure uh, to, to do so and, and probably a lot of behind the scenes work too. Uh, you wonder uh, what's, what's happening um, with, uh, with students who might be maybe those Arizona State students from China. Why were they denied re-entry um, when they've been successfully studying to as, as late as May this year? Uh, at Arizona State. Well, why were they denied? Was this another CBP officer on a power trip? Or what was, what was the cause there? Were they looking for ways to trip students up rather than to uh, open, keep those doors open and allow them to succeed here? Uh, you wonder about the students that might be going to smaller, um, lesser known schools uh, about how their journey is going to be when they re-enter the United States that were studying here in the, in the spring or returning for fall studies. Uh, that uh, are they going to get that same level of support from their university presidents or and the embassies that had issued them visas in the first place? That's that's a that's a little bit to less of a known factor there. So I'm really uh, curious, and I pray we don't have more of these uh, more of these stories popping on our news feeds uh, and on social media uh, groups. Uh, that uh, look at the, the real damage that that is doing to our to our country and to our international education prospects as a nation. So 
couple of a uh, couple of in the end success stories, but certainly stories that uh, highlight some real challenges with our current system and how uh, our 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 government is or is not um, making the effort needed to allow serious students with funding to come to these shores and fulfill their dreams uh, and not get into niggly bits on social media that really have not, that have they've already been vetted once on the visa process before uh, for initial students uh, and anyone who's renewed their visa they've gone through that ds-160 form and had to answer that social media questions and have been vetted before they come to the border why is this happening again that's uh, that's the piece that i don't get uh, uh, is there no communication that these students have gone through this uh, at the, with the CBP officers? Uh, do they not realize this is now part of their journey, that these students are having to uh, be vetted already once uh, on the social media side before they come into the country? So some real questions that uh, we don't have answers to at this point, and hopefully we do in the coming months, but I uh, won't hold my breath on that one. Now, uh, last story I want to uh, touch on today is is one, uh, we've talked about China a number of times here on the Midweek Roundup, but we haven't really looked a lot at what's happening in terms of where they're getting their information about uh, life in the United States and uh, how political views are impacting uh, their studies. And we're seeing more stories like this uh, on what, how Chinese students are actually finding out information about uh, the United States, either before they get here or once they're here. Uh, and the sources, um, what we like to call fake, we we don't like it, but we we learn to identify fake news stories, uh, and there are algorithms to 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 prove that now. But unfortunately, uh, in China, that's not always the case. Uh, that uh, obviously with their media there, it's uh, uh, a lot of it is uh, is party sponsored media or, or per, per, party approved media in in China. So we don't know. <laughs> Uh, we do, so the, we we know that unless they're getting access to the wider world through VPNs, they're they're what they're seeing is going to be very controlled. Uh, and the the article that I'm referring to here is uh, Chinese students and Western values. This is actually something that um, if you're familiar with Karen Fisher, one of the lead international uh, edit, uh, writers for the Chronicle of Higher Education, she now has a a newsletter of her own, uh, Latitudes, that comes out on Mondays. Um, and uh, in this most recent one uh, from August 25th, actually not most, a week or two ago, uh, she has uh, her the issue focused on Chinese students and Western values. Uh, it's talking in uh, referencing Hong Kong here uh, that uh, uh, starts with a, it's, uh, obviously Hong Kong has been a, a flashpoint for demonstrations now and some of the, the stress between uh, uh, mainland China and the, and the national, national government and uh, the semi quasi independent not really uh, Hong Kong a special administrative region uh, there have been numerous dem demonstrations of late that have uh, by pro-democracy uh, uh, elements in Hong Kong led by primarily by college students high school and college students uh, that are uh, initially the, the, the protests were um, related to uh, getting uh, a, a bill that had been introduced in the Hong Kong Parliament to uh, allow for extradition of Hong Kong residents to mainland China for offenses there. Um, so that was uh, tabled eventually, and uh, the uh, uh, Carrie Lam, the, uh, the, the director of Hong Kong's special administrative region, today uh, find out has uh, pulled that. Uh, pulled that bill completely off the docket for, for uh, discussion in the legislature there. So uh, well, will that quell the uh, Chinese uh, pro-democracy pro, uh, demonstrators there? We don't know, because uh, that was one of the initial, um, initial things. But what you're seeing now uh, is that universities around the globe now, uh, be highlighting this, these protests in Hong Kong, uh, you're seeing that mainland Chinese students have been taking the side of the, 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 of the, of the Beijing government, uh, and, and according to Karen's article, some t sometimes aggressively participating in counter demonstrations, trying to shout down those who disagree with them. 
and there were some posters that uh, uh, that Karen uh, po uh, posted a tweet from somebody at Auburn University that uh, were saying uh, shame on Hong Kong. What happens in Hong Kong, what, hap what happened in Hong Kong is not peaceful protest against all acts of violence. Uh, and another one with a Chinese heading says, I support the Hong Kong police. You can all beat me now. Um, you all can beat me now. So this is really, <laughs> uh, it's not just in, 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 in uh, at U.S. institutions. I've seen other news stories where this is happening in Australia. It's happening in New Zealand uh, for uh, students that are uh, taking, and if there were, for example, mainland Chinese students who were on the who were on these college campuses were becoming uh, were supporting the Hong Kong demonstrators uh, against the mainland government. This caused them all sorts of grief. So for many, um, and well, there's one story of a student's family back in Beijing being called in and being questioned by the authorities there after their son was found to have been participating in a pro-democracy uh, uh, protest on campus against the Chinese government. So for Chinese students, you got to wonder, are the, how, how, uh, how are they actually being um, lectured to, or le not lectured to, or controlled by the information that they're getting? Uh, and Karen's story uh, refers, uh, references of the South China Morning Post and China, oh, actually more, more so China Daily as one of the main news sources for Chinese students studying abroad, uh, to keeping in touch with what's going on and Chinese opinion on, uh, on education and other things on politics. And it seems that China Daily is what, is what, what Karen has identified as one of those potential fake news sources uh, in China that don't pay, paint a flattering picture of uh, certainly um, all the time of, of U.S. of the U.S. and U.S.-China relations, and certainly our pro-Chinese uh, uh, government uh, mouthpiece in, in her in, in, in a lot of respects. So it's interesting to see where all this will go in the coming weeks and months. Uh, obviously, China is a, an important uh, source of students for not just the United States, but for Canada, for the U.K., for Australia. Uh, New Zealand, uh, most of the other major English language destinations depend on China uh, for anywhere from 25% to 40% of their international students in their countries. So um, relations, uh, if they're going wrong at the top, it's going to filter down uh, to student flows. Uh, we've seen the UK and Canada seeing an uptick over the last couple of years. Australia has been on a run with China. There's signs that that might be changing there. Uh, there over, uh, there's a lot of public backlash against uh, the over-reliance of uh, Australian universities on China. I've seen a story this past week uh, that uh, of uh, interest in visitor and uh, immigrant visas to Canada from China has decreased dramatically since they uh, uh, held uh, one of the Huawei uh, vice chairman or uh, uh, certainly one of the leaders of, of Huawei in, uh, from China was held in Canada uh, for prosecution in the U.S. So they're, they're taking, Chinese are taking it out on Canada in terms of their interest in going there for immigration and visas, uh, visitors, uh, visas, uh, not sure, sure on the student front. But certainly it's, uh, it's, a, it's a recognition that, uh, that you, too many destination countries, particularly English-speaking destination countries, are overly dependent on China. Uh, we know that in the U.S., they, they realize that in Australia, uh, certainly they do in the U.K. and Canada, I think, as well. Canada has recently come out with a new diversity plan, uh, their new international education strategy to radically diversify uh, their international population. So we're going to see, it's a lot, of, a lot of folks are waking up to uh, the potential dangers of over-reliance on one or two countries. And uh, certainly the U.S. is, is uh, no, uh, institutions in the U.S. certainly are ones that are uh, very keen to, uh, hopefully, those that are aware of what's going on in the world, certainly aware of the value of uh, diversification of their international student populations. Uh, glad to see Marjorie joining in from uh, University of Denver. Hope all is well with you in the Rocky Mountain State. Uh, and looking forward to chatting with you all again in the coming weeks as uh, these news stories develop. Uh, certainly for those who want to catch and uh, see the archive of these, uh, you can check them out on our Facebook page under the videos tab or on our YouTube channel for SMIE Consulting. Uh, all the archive of these going back uh, a year now are, on a, are available on a playlist on our YouTube channel. So please uh, check them out there. 
And if you're subscribing on the podcast, thank you again for listening, Karen Bauer. I'm glad to have you on live today, and I uh, hope that uh, you're finding finding these uh, roundups valuable for you and your work with Education USA as well. So for that's all for today, and we look forward to catching up with you in the days and weeks to come. Cheers.